Welcome to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brannan, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. Ross Brannan is a financial advisor who knows it's not just about your teeth. He helps dental practice owners protect and maximize today's cash flow to plan for tomorrow's cash needs. Find him at rossbrannan.com. On the show, he brings together experts to help dental professionals looking to make smart money decisions to grow their income, turn their retirement goals into reality, and improve their lives. And now, here's your host, Ross Brannan. Welcome to the show. Today we have James Stafford III. He is an attorney with Clark Hill based in Dallas, Texas. He focuses on healthcare regulations and transactions. James, welcome to the show. Ross, it's an honor to be here with you. As I mentioned to you, I thought it'd be fitting to shoot this particular podcast from a dental office. So, yes, his wife is actually a practicing dentist. So not only is he an attorney for dentists and other healthcare providers, but he's married to a dentist. So talk specifically about what you do in regards to your legal practice. I help providers provide, focus on providing anything and everything else. I help get it out of their hair so that they can focus on taking care of the patient. And that comes with the background, as you mentioned, in helping my wife with her practice and practices that we've acquired over the years. So in a nutshell, I want to be and endeavor to be an extension of your office for specialized legal needs in addition to counsel with regard to the business of practicing dentistry. So let's give a real world example. Tell us an example of one way you helped a dentist recently from a legal perspective. We just started a very interesting transaction where the problem with adding new people to a team uh, becomes complex when it's your co-provider. And I say provider. So when dentists determine that they want to start working together, there are lots of complexities that they don't necessarily think about. And the one complexity that this group did not think about uh, was credentialing. Uh, Because they wanted to use uh, multiple locations, we had a very complex, or merge multiple locations, we had a very complex credentialing process that uh, was not uh, initially thought about. And so what we had to do is, uh, I'm sorry, the, the complex component was that one of the dentists owned uh, the lab that they were going to to use. And so we have to be careful whenever there's referrals going back and forth with a lab because of some of the um, regulatory issues, anti-kickback, um, uh, Stark, those issues that you have to, to think about. So uh, I think that we provided a value to the clients because we were able to quickly identify that issue, get that to the professionals that handle that best, and we work with a credentialing group and resolve that so the transaction could go forward with uh, with that untanglement, you know, kind of in the forefront. So got it resolved. Uh, we're still working on the deal, but uh, that was, uh, I think we had a lot of value by bringing that perspective. So what are the typical challenges you see that dentists face where they really need legal representation, where they may not actually hire a lawyer? It's often the employees. I get more calls about employee issues, again, from the perspective of it's my partner in a, you know, operating an agreement business association, and then just the run of the mill, the, my hygienist doesn't get along with my assistant. The real, the bottom line on any p uh, or I should say the highest costs relate to the real estate or whatever you're paying for your space and your employee. And those two things often give you the most trouble. So employee issues are the first. The second, as I mentioned, is the real estate. What did my landlord do? You know, 2020 is a great example where there were just so many complex issues happening about, you know, how long can I have to pay my uh, lease or pay my mortgage or whatever the issue was because the state of Texas and many other states decided that, Dentistry was not an urgent medical need 
Moreover, dentistry created a proliferation of COVID-19 spread because of the uh, the aerosols that are used in the dental practice. So top issue, it's definitely employees. Second issue, I would say, is uh, leasing and or mortgage company issues. And having a an employee issue can be very costly, can it not? Absolutely. Allegations of overtime are often the most costly. You have to be careful as a dentist. Uh, Which, by the way, how overtime is an issue when most dental practices aren't even open five days a week, I find to be hilarious. Yes, yes. But there are also administrative days that often are the, the issues because, you know, the dentist will say, well, I know you have, you know, you've got some time, so we're not open on this day. Go ahead and go in and get caught up on claims. You know, we want you, especially if you're doing it in-house, you tell your persons to go in there, get caught up on claims, clean the rooms. And so that turns into an all-day affair because you turn on the, and I do this, you turn on the cameras and you look and you see, you know, they're skating up and down the halls or on their phones or doing other, other things. But, you know, obviously uh, when, uh, when you're not being closely monitored, some things may take a little bit longer. Not to say that it always happens, but anyway, yes, we only are open four days a week, but how did you get 85 hours? I don't know. Um, and it becomes a problem whenever there's a dispute with the particular employee and there's a departure of their services or a termination of their services. And then all of a sudden, all of those extra text messages and all of those you know, extra hours in the office are now uh, at issue because they need to collect as much as they can so they can tie themselves over until they can find their next gig. So... How often do you see a dentist, quote unquote, be too cheap to not hire an attorney and it end up costing them exponentially more than the attorney's fees would have cost? More often than not. But of course, I'm going to see uh, the worst of the worst. Uh, I love to get clients at the very initiation of their practice. Just an introduction to say, hey, how are you? This is what I'm playing. This is my business plan. How could you help? Uh, those are the great conversations to have, but often maybe it's after they've received a petition from uh, the opposing party, from someone that maybe slipped and fell at their practice. Um, then we're looking at the lease and seeing whether or not they have liability for that. For instance, it was a case recently, or uh, again, the employee gets terminated and the disputes that they had with the dentist earlier were not properly documented. Uh, their employee handbook did not communicate PTO, for example. The employee handbook did not communicate whether or not the PTO that they earned would be given to them if there were a terminable offense. You know, some of those things are critical to have because it adds insult to injury. And at the end of the day, your unemployment insurance, it may go up a little bit, but it's really not, you know, Comparably speaking, it's not that big of an issue if your unemployment insurance goes up or you pay uh, some, you know, 30, say 10 hours of, of accrued but not used uh, PTO time. So uh, if you have your documents in order, though, your employee handbook and employee agreement, and it says that if I terminate you, you lose all your PTO that you have in your bank, then you feel a lot better when the termination comes and they're not able to to make those claims because it's unfortunate. But when I do get those calls, I'll say, hey, you know, they did, you know, accumulate that time. What's your employee handbook say? And a lot of the times the answer is, well, what employee handbook? Well, that was my next question. It was like how often everyone knows they should have an employee handbook, but how often do they know that they should actually have an employee handbook. You you know, but then do you really know and how often do people execute on it? Yeah, that's the problem, the execution. So maybe they know about it and maybe someone uh, provided one to them and maybe they do it the first time to the first employee, but then the second and third employee, they forget. I tell folks that when you are adding employees, you're making some sort of change, it's it's just great to pick up the phone and, and grab 15 minutes of our time to to have a communication about that issue. Uh, as I mentioned, I, of course, am a lawyer and focus on legal issues. But as uh, the white, the husband of a dentist, I can talk to you a lot about just practical practice tips. 
and being diligent and communicating with your employees and being diligent and documenting what you communicate to your employees is important. Yeah. So what, as an outsider, as a lawyer who's married to a dentist, what do you see in a dental practice that your wife misses because she's, her mind just works differently. It's the documentation. You know, providers do a great job of documenting and notes and, you know, those types of things. But, you know, we just had a dispute with someone, uh, you know, an employee. So it happened. We know about it, but did we document it? Because let's say this issue happens again next week uh, and then the week after that. Document it does, documenting it does two things. Of course, it protects you from a legal perspective. But at the same time, providers have to realize there are leaders in the office. And as the leader of the office, they have to not only, you know, work and provide services, but lead the team. And leading the team means developing the team. And developing the team comes from uh, periodic assessments of, of performance. When you document the performance and issues with the performance, you're able to come back and have something to to develop the team and show progress or a departure from progress. Uh, and of course, protect yourself legally if you needed to terminate the employee for their inability to progress. I would say documentation is number one. I think uh, two is just, you don't know what you don't know. So this is uh, 2023, which is a legislative year for the state of Texas. There are about 13 initiatives that we're looking at that may change everything. One of the biggest initiatives I might mention, Ross, is a federal initiative from the FTC, which you probably heard about, and that is the repeal of the ability for any company to have a non-compete agreement, which is huge. Now, now I've heard about that, and I'm familiar with that, but is it accurate to say that most non-competes are not enforceable to begin with? I wouldn't say that. I okay. wouldn't say that. Uh, because if I drafted it, of course it's enforceable. <laughs> well, does, it, does it depend on the state? For example, absolutely. I've heard in the state of Alabama, they're not really enforceable. Yeah, so it absolutely depends on, on the state. And I've not argued for or against a non-compete in the state of Alabama. So I, I wouldn't be able to opine. But I will tell you, it's a little bit different, difficult in California. Uh, in Texas, I can certainly make one enforceable with certain statutory um, grounds. Same thing with New York, uh, Florida. But all of those states have nuances that we would have to look at and then make sure uh, they're enforceable. So generally speaking, of course, I should have given my overall uh, non-attribution. I'm not you know, giving any legal advice, but there it is for everything I said before and after. <laughs> but generally speaking, to have an enforceable non-compete, the distance or geographic scope has to be reasonable and the time has to be reasonable. So for instance, a 10 year non-compete is likely going to be held to be unreasonable unless it's connected to a more complex transaction. Um, and let's say that complex transaction could be uh, the sale of a practice. And so if there's a value attached to make the non-compete enforceable for a duration longer than two years, by the way, two years is probably the most reasonable, then there may be justification for uh, you know a longer non-compete. Geographic scope is all dependent on where is the practice located. So in an urban area, two or three miles in a a very dense population might be uh, unreasonable because of you know the scope or the density. Whereas you know if we're in a rural area and I make it ten miles, that could be reasonable because there's you know nowhere else within the area for, area to work and then kind of vice versa. So geographic scope and reasonableness, all of those things have have an impact on the evaluation of whether or not a non compete is enforceable. And of course, state law overlaying. Uh, now federal law, which will be interesting to see whether or not that gets passed. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. Do you have a personal non-legal opinion on that? If you had, if you were king of Texas for a day, would you vote that down or vote it for, be fine with it? The personal opinion, I... The non-legal personal opinion. Non-legal personal opinion. Okay, I'll turn my head, hat around because... You know, obviously, I benefit from this practice doing well. So as a business owner, I would say that I would want to 
be against a repeal of a non-compete. I bargained for it. I think I should be able to enforce it to make sure my practice stays safe from my associates here at the practice starting another practice. So, so, I think so the reality right. is if you own a dental practice, no matter what state, you need to be aware of this type of stuff. You need to keep your ear to the ground on legislative sessions. For example, in Florida, they have done some tort reform. If you're a lawyer, specifically like a personal injury lawyer, that can affect you in, in, uh, in some ways. So you definitely need to keep, keep your ear to the ground. So, so what you're saying here is, and you and I have talked about this before, there is this, um, this kind of balance or this tension or this continuum of like on one opposite, on one end of the spectrum, you have basically a dentist who owns their job. And I've told this example numerous times on this podcast. And the other end, you have a business owner who happens to be a dentist. If you own your job, you may not pay attention to this as much. You might hear it when it's too late. You might hear it secondhand. If you're a business owner, you kind of keep your ears to the ground and make sure you know what's going on in this regard. And this something, just something little like this is something that's important for people. Yeah, absolutely, Ross. And the perspective on those two types of personalities, we'll call them two types of operators, is is much different. So the value of being aware of legislation that inhibits your business from protecting itself from the perspective of the owner, as opposed to the owner of your of your job, um, is much more uh, diligent. Um, and I would argue that that person, that operator of the business versus the operator of the employment will be more diligent in many aspects of protecting their practice and protecting their investment. Whereas, you know, the provider uh, is focused on providing, um, which is great, but there are things that you have to walk away from and be able to, to look at the problem, look at the issues from a a third party perspective, the perspective of not just the provider, but as the business owner. So you continue to monitor what is best for the practice itself to be able to continue to provide the services that you want to provide. Obviously a non-compete would apply to an associate dentist. Would it apply to a hygienist? Yes, we certainly can. And Having a non-compete for a hygienist is often very critical. And I'm thinking about one client in particular. The hygienist was a deciding factor for an associate dentist's ability to open up another practice. And so the my client was not so stressed about the dentist leaving, but the hygienist was the non-compete that we actually sought to enforce to dissuade many of the patients that had, you know, such a relationship with that hygienist from leaving. So it's important to think about, you know, the personalities of your practice that, you know, make them fit. I'm thinking about, you know, another practice, again, where the hygienist was just the face of the practice, very energetic and very, 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 very great with the patients. So, so it's important to think about, do I need a non-compete with my, with my hygienist? Do you, um, let, let's talk about transactions. You, you do obviously regulation, what we were just talking about. Talk about what you do in regards to transactions. We talked about where my practice is right now. I'm 42 years old and many of my clients are about the same age. And I moved to Clark Hill to work with clients to think about where their practice will be in three, five, and 10 years from now. I can tell you, and I've told my clients this, dentists have a shorter work uh, life span because of the intense physical nature of their practice. They're pulling teeth. They, they're hearing high-pitched drills and bits. And They have the highest claim rate among, uh, 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 in the medical world, and that's why disability companies will, will, will offer them about only – just under 60% of what they would offer. Actually, no. Yeah, just under 60% of what they offer uh, physicians. For, uh, wow. So, yeah. Wasn't, wasn't aware of that one. But it yeah, just so, so a physician can get $30,000 a month of disability coverage. A dentist can get $17,000. Wow. 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 Well, it all makes sense. And so the conversation is, hey, you know, what are you thinking about three, five, ten years from now? 
And what does your what does what is the value of your practice? And this goes back to our conversation about do you own your employment or do you own a, an actual business? So we help clients think about that and then take advantage of those opportunities. That is, do I sell to someone else? Do I, you know, bring on a younger associate, train them up and sell my practice <clears throat> to that associate? Um, and then, of course, there's a uh, private equity out there, often in the form of a dental servicing organization or, you know, more commonly known as a DSO. I will tell you now that we work with DSOs now, but I still work with a lot of dentists and help them with the transaction. So whenever a dentist is approached by a DSO, we're able to help them negotiate um, certain terms for uh, the cooperation that the DSO brings. More often than not, dentists look at what would be, <clears throat> excuse me, a great transaction and a great you know, departure from the ownership aspect and having a DSO take over the practice. Uh, so let's say, for example, dentist age to 50, looking at retirement in five years. Uh, the deal that I see often is that the DSO comes in and says, hey, if you stay for three years, we'll pay you X, and then we'll give you X number of dollars for your practice. You know, at, at the beginning of this transaction, the middle of this transaction, and then at the end of the transaction. Let's, let's be specific. Dentist makes right now about $150,000. That's what they were making at the practice. The DSO's ideas, you know, we can increase marketing, you know, have a negotiation with with the insurance companies, get better rates. And so they make a projection based on the dentist's P&L statement and say, you know, we can, we can give you about a half million dollars for your practice, and, but you'll need to stay for about two years and we'll pay you $100,000. So it's our job to go in and either – get more than $500,000 by showing value for your practice or, you know, asking or demanding that you get a higher salary during that five-year period, make the non-compete more flexible for you. We make, we, you know, we have all those conversations. And Are you replacing that, a broker? Well, arguably we're replacing a broker, but obviously we're trying to help you, you know, with, with the transaction. Because the broker is going to want to have an attorney coming in here anyway, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, because it gets complex whenever the dentist or, uh, you know, provider is not able to have or does not have a good structure set up, a legal structure. So we'll go in and make sure those things are set up. You know, one of the other complications, if you have a, a in-practice payment system, you know, often those are not documented properly where you give certain discounts to, you know, those private pays or there's no insurance folks. So from a transactional standpoint, you know, with with again with the transaction, I call that kind of a terminating of, uh, event. We're able to provide services there. I mentioned to you the leasing issue. You know, we've got specialized folks with leasing, but there are certain components. Well, the biggest one that always jumps out to me when I'm looking at a lease is whether or not there's a, a declination by the landlord that they understand that HIPAA supersedes any type of agreement and that there can't be a disconnection between the dentist's ability to have access to their to the medical records because the medical records are essentially not even owned by the dentist, even though they're controlled by the dentist, but ultimately the patient owns uh, the dental dental records. So that needs to be of record and, you know, at least should not be signed unless it's look, looked at by a healthcare attorney. And I assume that is always an issue. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because those landlords don't have a clue, I would imagine. They don't and nor do they care, but of course, you have to argue as best you can, especially if, you know, at the renewal time, uh, you need to make sure that you have a great counsel because they know they've got you once you're in there. So they're a little bit more hardcore uh, when, when you're, when you're thinking about renewing. And that's, that's another great point. Don't call us or, you know, always call us, but it's more difficult for us when we're, you know, you're one week away from your lease renewing versus, you know, about so a year. It's always done. You know that. <laughs> I love those calls, right? <laughs> But yeah, think about it at least a year out, if not more. Um, but really, we should look at the agreement because certain triggers and leases happen you know, long before the renewal date comes up. So if you're looking at your lease, don't just look at your lease and say, okay, it's March, to, you know, April the 1st, 2023. So I'll call James on, you know, March 31st because probably, you know, 180 days before that, you should have declared 
either your intention to move, not the, notwithstanding the fact that you should be thinking about that anyway, comparing rates, et cetera, et cetera. But there's lots of triggers that happen before the actual renewal date. So as we wind down here, what are some questions that I should have asked that I didn't ask? What, what do our listeners need to know? Everything changes from a legal perspective. Uh, so it's good to have a relationship with counsel. So either you're getting updates from them from you know their website or you're just checking in with them uh, from the standpoint of uh, making sure your practice continues to be compliant. When I do my house calls, I often look for the DOL uh, notices. Uh, every office should have a Department of Labor. You know, there's a, a little... I call I've it. I've heard an audit by the DOL is worse than an audit by the IRS. <laughs> you know, it's from the perspective of the lawyer, it's it's really fun because the DOL they'll trip over their feet once you get counsel involved. But yes, IRS. I've not participated in an IRS 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 audit, but a DOL audit is is very interesting. Um, <laughs> I've got a great story about the DOL audit. When I was a very, very young associate before I was specialized in dental care, we were helping a manufacturer of a chicken plant. And that was a complete mess with chickens all over the place. But <laughs> we're not here to talk about that. But uh, getting back to your question, you know, do you have your name correctly uh, annotated on your door? You know, those are certain, certain things, you know, ours, are, are they clearly displayed, you know, those those types of things, all of those things can be uh, quickly identified and reconciled by your counsel. Here's a question that I, that I just thought about. I mean, obviously a lot of your clients are business partners, correct? You might have. Yes. Um, so before they met you, how often do they have a buy-sell? And how often do they have a uh, buy-sell actually funded? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> buy-sells happen in one of two ways, either well-documented or not well-documented. Which uh, 90% are not well-documented. Yes. And the number one thing that gets us into the most trouble where we need to make disclosures, and that is the sale of patient records. That is such a red flag to an attorney to know that no one sophisticated, you know, looked at the deal. Uh, more often than not, it doesn't happen. But, you know, ladies and gentlemen on the call, patient records cannot be sold. As I mentioned to you earlier, the patient record is owned by the patient. So in the transaction, there's a specific way um, using a lockbox of making sure the patient charts are transitioned. And yes, there's a goodwill valuation that's going on in the back of someone's mind that says, I've got, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 patients in the practice. Sure, that's part of the goodwill from just an economic standpoint, but from a documentation standpoint, you can't sell someone else's medical records. It's just, it's just illegal, but it happens all the time. So we make sure that you have a great buy-sell agreement. One of the other big things I'm sure, Ross, you look at is, you know, what are you selling and what does it look like in terms of an asset purchase agreement and where does the value of that $500 million transaction, where are we where are we specifically lining out those particular assets to be related to? Is it related to the equipment? Is it related to the goodwill? All of those have very, very important tax implications uh, when we're doing the transaction. So those are the two biggest things that I see whenever we're doing a buy-sell agreement. So you're in Dallas, Texas. Uh, you're obviously licensed to practice in Texas. Do you practice in any other states? We have 26 offices across the country and two international offices. So where I'm not licensed to practice, I certainly have someone among the 650 or so attorneys that we have across the country that is licensed in the state where wherever we're practicing. Okay. I like to be your quarterback. Again, you establish a relationship with an attorney. Uh, I specialize in healthcare, but my you know my partners pr practice and specialize in you know anything and all things business, including some white collar criminal things as well. So you give us a call and we will do our best to find the specialist in your area so that we can get you the best legal services. Well, James, how do, how do people get in touch with you? Well, just go to our website, clarkhill.com and look up James Stafford and get all my contact information. And I'm happy to, you know, subsequently send my, my card, business card or contact information to anyone that uh, reaches out to you, Ross. Fantastic. Well, James, thanks so much for coming on today. Ross, it was my pleasure. Take care now. You've been listening to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brannan. 
This has been another episode of Financial Flossing with Ross Brannan, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. If you liked what you heard, consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. For more on Ross Brannan, visit rossbrannan.com. Ross Brandon is a registered representative of Coastal Equities, Inc., and investment advisory representative of Coastal Investment Advisors, Inc. Investment advisory services are offered through Coastal Investment Advisors, Inc., and securities are offered through Coastal Equities, Inc. Member FINRA, SIPC, 1201 North Orange Street, Suite 729, Wilmington, Delaware, 19801.